Well, you know, there's several different obstacles that companies are going to have to get over to succeed. First of all, the technology has to work. Um, you know, your, the, the rocket engines, the airframe, all that has to come together in the right way. Um, certainly you have to find the right markets to go after. Um, a lot of people are interested in tourism, um, but there are a lot of interest in research. There may be other markets that we don't anticipate now and may not emerge until these vehicles start flying, but you have to, you know, have to have those initial markets to go after to build up the flights to encourage the other markets to come on. You know, and that ties in also into the financing aspects. I think one of the biggest obstacles for, for companies trying to develop these vehicles has been trying to raise the money. You've seen the companies that have made the most progress, by and large, have been companies that have had their own wealthy backer, whether it's Richard Branson or Elon Musk or John Carmack or uh, Jeff Bezos, um, that had their own money and their own passion to see through uh, the long development time that a uh, uh, a more typical institutional investor wouldn't necessarily have the patience um, to do so, even if they're willing to put the money up front. So that's a that's a major challenge. Uh, and then there's also you know the regulatory issue. I think uh, a lot of the regulations associated with um, human spaceflight are in pretty good shape, um, thanks to some foresight of people in industry and government, uh, in the FAA in particular, um, to help companies understand what they need uh, in order to to fly safely. But as these vehicles evolve, the regulatory market uh, environment is going to evolve. Uh, and certainly on the orbital space flight side, uh, when you're carrying NASA astronauts, you're going to have the additional factor of meeting NASA's needs. Uh, and that could compose some complications for companies that uh, uh, are focused on meeting the FAA's requirements. And so that's a, a potential obstacle that will have to be overcome. So there's certainly no smooth path uh, for any of these companies to succeed. Um, but there's a way to chart a path through those obstacles um, to reach success. And then there's the things like the Russians making noise about uh, uh, about hooking up to the ISS uh, for, with commercial craft. Yeah, cer yeah, certainly. I mean, there. I think that's a necessarily a less anticipated factor. But there's certainly there there are these wild cards like the. Uh, the Russians suggesting that you know a company like SpaceX may not be ready yet to, to dock, and you have to deal with a project like the International Space Station to ensure all the partners are on board for these uh, these initiatives, particularly these new American commercial initiatives. I think they'll they'll realize in the long run, it's to their benefit because this is going to open up access to the space station. It's going to make it less expensive for their astronauts as well as ours to get to the space station uh, and to make the space station a really long-term viable program for all the partners. It's a matter of getting over that uh, initial um, concern um, or skepticism about the commercial capabilities to get to that point. Well, you know, I, I see Bigelow as a company that's going to be a major customer for commercial orbital vehicles once they're developed because they're absolutely critical to his business plan. He's got the technology to build these inflatable habitats. Uh, launching them into orbit is not a, a, a major issue, but there's no reason to launch them until there's spacecraft that are able to actually access them to transport crews, their customers to the station, to carry cargo to the stations. That's the real limiting factor in his business plan. So you see him partnering with Boeing on the CST-100. I'm sure he'd be interested in being a customer of SpaceX or, or Sierra Nevada or Blue Origin if they have uh, commercial orbital vehicles uh, ready to enter service as well. Um, so he, you know, he, that's a potentially major source of demand for these vehicles on top of NASA. So it helped the industry, the initial source of demand. Obviously, it helps Bigelow because it's critical to his uh, to his business plan. But I think he's got a, he's got a vision for uh, for space commercialization, and he's looking beyond you know the typical markets like tourism to look at things like research, um, so-called sovereign clients, um, space agencies that don't have their own launch vehicles or space stations that would be willing to lease one of these stations for a month or a year um, so that all of a sudden uh, a South Korea or Malaysia has their own space station with their own astronauts on there um, leapfrogging ahead of, of, uh, of other countries. So, you know, I, I, th I think there's a lot of potential there. It's a matter of having all the pieces come into place, in particular the, the transportation aspect. Um, and I think once he demonstrates these vehicles in low Earth orbit, I know he's shown a lot of interest in exploration beyond using the, the same technology, whether it's going back to the moon or elsewhere in the solar system. 
um, you know, there's a, there's there's some long-term potential there as well that uh, that we'll have to see uh, when and if it gets realized. And we had a session with uh, George Whiteside and with, uh, with Virgin Galactic just concluded. Uh, what what uh, what was of interest uh, to you in the, in that discussion today in that presentation? You know that they're they're making slow but steady progress on the development of their vehicle. They're going through a series of glide tests. They've tested the feathering mechanism that they need for the safe reentry of the vehicle. Um, they're still a little while away from actual powered flight tests. They're still working on the engine. That seems to be a uh, a major limiting uh, factor in in their development is getting that engine ready to go. Uh, but they seem to be making progress. They're they're continuing to sign up customers. You know that the. You know, they, even though they're still a while away from flying, there's, they still have people coming up and, and uh, George mentioned even that as they've done these flight tests, these glide tests, the, the rate of ticket sales is actually starting to move up a little bit. People are starting to realize this is a real system, you know, that this isn't just an animation or a cool video. This is an actual spacecraft that's undergoing flight tests that one day they may be able to fly in. Uh, so you're starting to see an uptick in ticket sales because of that, and they're actually starting work on building the second Spaceship 2 and second White Knight 2 that they anticipate that they'll need once they start entering commercial service. Their flight rate increases, and they start from flying once a week to perhaps as much as once a day. Uh, so they're making, they're, you know, it's, it's not going again nearly as, as, as fast as they might have optimistically thought a few years ago, um, but, they're, but they're moving along, and they've got some some long-term vision for um, orbital space flight, for launching small satellites, for projects like that, that are sort of on the back burner, because I think they, they see that building Spaceship Two, getting that thoroughly tested, putting in commercial services, is the next major thing they need to do, and then they can worry about some of these, these long-term initiatives.